You're listening to TIP. On today's episode, I sit down with Mark Hentman to talk about his success stories investing in real estate in the Los Angeles market. Mark Hentman is a writer and producer for the animated hit TV show Family Guy, among many others. How does a TV show writer get into real estate? We'll talk about that throughout this entire episode. Mark is a longtime real estate investor who now owns over 400 units, primarily in the Los Angeles area. He got into real estate during the early days of his career when terms like house hacking weren't even a thing yet. And I'm sure his experiences will inspire a new generation of investors, like he has by mentoring one of our previous guests, Kyle Marcotte. So it's a pretty cool experience to have here on the show where we have had the mentee and now the mentor. But without further delay, let's get into this episode with Mark Hentman. You're listening to Real Estate Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful investors from various real estate investing niches to help educate you on your real estate investing journey. Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's show. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I'm excited to bring you this episode with Mark Hentman. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks, Robert. Great to be here. Let's start the conversation by talking about your background for those who may not be familiar with you. What got you into real estate? Where'd you start and where are you today? Well, I got started. I moved to Los Angeles from New York. I'm originally from Ohio, but uh, I got started and you know, had a tough time as most people do trying to break into the writing business and the entertainment business. And I had been broke and I did get some traction and I worked on work for David Letterman in New York. And then I came out to LA and joined a show that was just called Family Guy. And I had gotten my first couple script payments. I was basically my one bedroom apartment in LA and the landlord raised the rent and I went and visited an apartment and on one Sunday at an open house and walked out and next door was a house for sale and there was a broker there giving tours and I just wandered in because it was a just a bored Sunday and it was something to do. And I started talking to this broker and the broker's like, why are you looking for an apartment? You should be putting your money towards a mortgage. And I was like, a mortgage? It's the last thing I need. You know, I'm in the entertainment business. I pretty much expected to be unemployed half the time, half of my career. And, uh, and I said, I don't want to take on that risk. And she said, you should really think about it. And I said, the only uh, reason I would ever take on a mortgage is it would have to be the best investment I had ever made. I don't want the, the burden of a, of a house, a big house payment. So I gave her my number, left, figured I'd never hear from her again. I got a call a couple of weeks later and she said, I found the property you need to buy. And um, she's like, but there's a catch. You need to become a landlord. And I was like, a landlord? That doesn't sound like any fun. And I met her at the property. It was a, a duplex kind of rundown in a transitional part of LA, but it was up and coming. And you know, I looked at it. I could see the bones. It was a cool, old, historic duplex with nice architecture, but the owners were raising goats and chickens in the backyard. It, it needed a lot of work. And they were, I think they were moving moving to Kansas, leaving LA to dig a hole and live in a house underground and live off the grid. But anyway, I, I thought about it and I thought there was some potential here. So that's how I got in. I, I put a bid on, on this duplex and you know, unexpectedly, and it was LA, my experience this in Boston is, is there was like 15 other buyers and we got in a bidding war. I had no idea what I was doing. I was terrified. The price was going up basically about 15 grand every day. And I had no idea how to value this thing. And it was a roller coaster ride, but I kept looking to this broker for guidance. And she was like, I I think it's worth it. I think this was underpriced and stick with it. And I did. And after two weeks, I won the bidding war and, you know, immediately regretted it. But I think I had, uh, I think it was listed at $379,000. This was back in 2000. And I won the bidding war at 435000 and figured I had just made the biggest mistake of my life, but tried to embrace it and moved in and started fixing it up. My tenant was a guy named Mike Henry. He does the voice of, of Herbert and Consuela and who else? Cleveland on Family Guy. And 
you know, so he was kind of either an easy tenant to start with or a bad tenant, but he, he was a good tenant to learn how to become a landlord with and, you know, just went about trying to fix this place up and figured in year one, I figured this was the biggest mistake I had made in my life. And I was probably going to lose this property, go bankrupt. But after a year, you know, I was able to fix it up, raise the rents. I refinanced and, and lowered my rate. And I started to think maybe this isn't such a bad thing. And then within like maybe by year two or year three, I was like, this is the greatest thing in the world because it was paying all my expenses and, uh, you know, it was appreciating. And I really fell for real estate and I was, I was, committed. I'm like, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. So nowadays we would call that a house hack. That's the strategy. But back <laughs> then I'm assuming that that wasn't known as, as an investment strategy. So when you went into this, were you expecting to use half of that rent to pay off your mortgage? I mean, you were looking for a property to, to just buy like just a house. So I'm assuming you weren't necessarily looking for that and it kind of just fell in your lap. But what did you learn or how great was that for your first property to be a house hack that you weren't necessarily expecting? And I was behind the curve on everything. Yeah, I had never heard the term house hack. I don't think that was much of a term back then. And I knew that I would have rental income and I knew what that rental income was, was at the time. I think it was around maybe 1400, 1450. The other side was paying. And then, you know, I knew it was going to help pay the mortgage. And I knew that was the concept of a duplex, but I was a little, little fearful of, of, just owning this property and being responsible for this property. But, but yeah, I, I jumped in and, and tried to embrace it. And because I was so convinced it, I had made a big mistake that I was reading and trying to educate myself and learn everything I could about real estate, that experience of that bidding war, that, that two-week period where every day I had to make a decision on, you know, everyone else was going up $15,000. Did I want to stay with that or did I want to bail? And you know, I was going through that. I thought I never want to go through this again. There was so much anxiety, so much stress. I was like, I wish so badly that I had educated myself before I got into this situation. So as soon as I took ownership, you know, I started reading every book I could on on real estate management. You know, even even the accounting and taxation of it. You know, it like I said, it took me a little bit of time to embrace it or even feel comfortable that I had made the right decision. But you know, it became clear, and it wasn't that long. As it was maybe you know a year and a half in or two years in, I think rates were going down. I think I my first rate was about a seven percent interest rate, which seems astronomical now, but it was uh, you know rates were higher in the early two thousands. And I as I refied and lowered that rate down from like a seven to a four, you know, it just so much improved the economics. And pretty soon. And, and I know, but my friend Mike lived there for like two years, but then he moved out and I you know, increased the rent. I think we started at fourteen fifty, dollars and, and within a couple of years, we were at like nineteen fifty, dollars and, uh, and lowered the rate. And that's when I was hooked. I was like, this is a model of like an economic model, an investment model that seems so valuable. You know, as many people experience new investors or people just, you know, graduating from school and getting out into the world. When I was in that apartment, I felt like I felt like the world was conspiring against you. Like when you when you enter the real world out of school, like uh, bills, paying bills, paying rents, things faster than your income is every year. And I had this thing, like this theory, like yeah, there's the world is conspiring against you, and everything you can't see and uh, don't know about seems to be working against you. But I got into real estate, and while I, it was the opposite, when I got into real estate, as I was owning this thing, everything seemed to be working in my favor. Like while I was sleeping, my loan principal was getting paid down. Uh, the the neighborhood was improving, so this property was appreciating. I was getting depreciation, which I didn't know about. So all these invisible forces were working in my favor, and it was uh, it was amazing. And it was, like I said. It was something I knew that it was it was going to be the perfect complement to a career in the entertainment industry. It would bring me financial security a lot faster than I otherwise would have found it. And uh, at this point, I've been doing it for twenty years, and I'm like, I'm going to do this until I'm a hundred. Uh, you know, I don't know, I don't want to retire. I don't have any interest in retiring. This is fun, and uh, 
long after I get spit out of the entertainment business, I'll be doing this. So where did you go from that house hack? What was your next deal or how long did you own it for? I owned it for five years. And because I was a first time buyer, I got, you know, I didn't know about that FHA loan back when I, when I first bought this, but I got a 10% down. So I put down about 43,500 on this, this duplex and I sold it five years after I bought it and uh, bought it for $435,000, sold it for 1.27 million, had fixed it up and uh, took that money, took those proceeds, which was, I can't remember exactly what those proceeds were, but I, I spun those into a six unit and a 14 unit. And what I had done is I'd read about the tax, real estate tax law and tax strategies. And I had learned about the, the married couple owner occupy credit, if you're familiar with that, which is uh, if you're a married couple and, and I had gotten married while I was in the duplex, but we took the combined married couple credit, which was $500,000. So you could take 500,000 of your gain tax-free. And so I did that. And I asked my CPA if I could 1031 exchange the other side, because there's basically a side-by-side duplex. And I said, can I take advantage of $500,000 tax-free? And then the rest of it, uh, 1031 exchange, which was the, the rest of it was maybe $350,000. And my CPA surprisingly said, yes, you can do that. And so I, I, I bought those, those two new multi- multifamily properties. And I knew that I wanted to go bigger. As I sat living in that duplex, I would always look across the street at the fourplex and the sixplex. And I was like, yeah, it'd be better to have six units instead of two. I, I appreciated the economies of scale in multifamily. What difficulties did you encounter when you went from just a duplex that you were also living in? So it's different than just a, a traditional rental property to scaling to that size of property where you're not probably living there. Now you have all kinds of different dynamics working for you or against you, depending how you're looking at it. But you're basically just having a much bigger asset and you're having all these different things that you have to deal with and manage now that you haven't had before. So what types of things did you encounter? Issues, problems, you know, unexpected headaches did you come across that you weren't expecting when you went from that house hack to those bigger deals? Well, I was I was looking, you know, honestly, I I I actually bought the fourplex, a fourplex, a fourplex a year before I sold my duplex. So I was already getting into multifamily. I was already committed to doing this. And I, I, I think loosely in my mind, I was going to buy maybe a building or two a year and try to do that every year and just build a portfolio. So I think my first challenge was to find good third-party property management. I, have, I was working at the time, you know, maybe 70 hours a week, 80 hours a week. And so I needed, I absolutely needed third-party property management. And I found a couple property management companies I started with one. I had them for maybe a couple of years. Didn't really like the the way they were padding the expenses. And then I moved on to, a, I got some recommendations. And you know, back then, looking back, I had a couple people that steered me, a couple professionals who had a lot of experience, who you know, could have taken advantage of me, particularly that first broker. Her name is June Ahn, and I'm still friends with her. But she was the one that Talked to me, basically talked me into not buying an apartment, not renting an apartment, but rather putting down a mortgage on this duplex. And she could have steered me wrong, like day after day, when she was telling me to raise my offer fifteen thousand dollars. It seemed crazy to me, but I did it. And you know, obviously, in retrospect, it was the right thing to do because you know, I basically tripled my money on this property on, on that first duplex, which launched me into you know much bigger multifamily. But she was one. Uh, there, there were a couple brokers that I got to know, and you know they were mentors to me. There was a guy at an escrow company that was great, and you know the property management always was a bit of a struggle. You know you got to watch them, but none of my property management experiences were too disastrous. So they they helped me along the way, and uh, yeah, my learning experiences were learning how to manage property management and. You know, just reading and, and learning everything about the metrics and, and how you, you could sharpen your, your buying criteria. Yeah. Otherwise, I always had, you know, a little bit of an artistic bent. So 
whenever I looked at a building, I could visualize, you know, how I wanted, how I thought it could be improved. So I was, you know, from day one, I was a value add investor, not even knowing what that was. I was, I liked the rough buildings, the rough properties, and I could envision like this could look amazing. And, and I would just break down what needed to be done. Do you think that if you had never done that first house hack, that you would have still became a real estate investor? <laughs> That's a good question. I kind of think I would have. I was always skeptical of stock market, giving your money over to an investment manager and just letting... I would have been frustrated. I would have been you know, eternally frustrated and eternally skeptical and suspicious if you know, someone else was managing my money. And you know, I experienced this a little bit with my retirement. Some of my IRAs is is they they eke out you know maybe a five to eight percent a year, and I liked having more control over it. And I may have I might have fallen into it along the way, but surely it would have taken longer for me to get in. I think this was a good baptism by fire. And so let's talk about what you're doing today. We talked about you started the house hack, then you went to a four unit, and then a little bit bigger. So let's fast forward all the way to today. What does your portfolio look like today? I am at about 400 units and I'm a possibly be closer to 500. I'm in escrow on a 90 unit. I consistently was buying value add multifamily in up and coming neighborhoods in Los Angeles. And my criteria was always, I want to buy something at a rock bottom cost per square foot. Because in part of that's because I was in a major city and I knew that, you know, in a major city, the land was very valuable, the location was very valuable, and it was a high priced market. And I wanted to buy as cheaply as possible. And so I, I targeted about 200, between 200 and 300 a square foot in LA. And at that number, I knew that that was about half of what it cost to replace, to build, given that LA is, is very, difficult to build and very expensive to get the permitting, go through that process and navigate that. And so I would do that, I would buy um, cheap value add at a good cap rate. And the cap rate allowed me to get leverage. So I did that over and over and over again. And you know, I built up to maybe 230, 250 units in Los Angeles. And then maybe you know, five years or six years into it, I decided you know, I should really get a second market. I should diversify. LA, you know, has earthquakes. And if I'm going all in on real estate, I should, I'd like to have a second market. And I wanted to pick what I thought was the best market. So I took my time. I spent maybe two years analyzing markets and watching markets and, and which one would be the best place to focus on and establish a, a beachhead in another market. And I zeroed in, I think ultimately I zeroed in on either Austin, Texas or Salt Lake City. They were both relatively easy to get to, but very strong, growing, growing populations, very strong business growth, rent growth, tech centers. And I, I landed on Austin. And so today I am in escrow to buy, I'm going to have about, about 300 units in Austin if this goes through this latest purchase. And uh, you know I'll have a couple hundred in uh, Los Angeles as well. How did you go about finding those markets? I mean, there's hundreds of markets across the US. So how did you narrow it down to those? I know you just mentioned population growth, income growth, things like that. But tactically, how did you narrow it down to those specific cities? It's funny. I thought that all I really needed to do is go online and, and look at what are the top markets for multifamily. But when I, when I did that, I found that there were 15 different answers and they all had a different, they all had a different top 10. And, and there was no consistency. So I, I figured I had to kind of do my own due diligence. So I would go on to city sites and just gather data, gather research. And I, I knew that Austin, Texas was had the highest population growth from 2010 through 2018. And then it, that continued, that trend continued up until today. And that's relative to size. I think there are, there are cities that add more people, but as a percentage basis, Austin was growing the fastest. It also was a tech hub where there's Apple, Oracle, Google, Amazon. They all had major presences there. It had a big university. And also importantly, 
it was hard to build. Austin was the most difficult city to build in Texas. And it had, and you want, I wanted barriers to supply. That's one of the things that drives prices upward in Los Angeles is I think the two most difficult cities to build in the United States is Honolulu, Hawaii, and Los Angeles. And that because the, the land is limited and the permitting process is difficult and expensive, I think Los Angeles, Los Angeles's prices continue to go up because the supply can't keep up with demand. And so that was one of the factors going towards my decision to invest in Austin. How did you scale from those first three properties that we talked about already to doing 100 unit deals? Did you continue to slowly get bigger and bigger? So maybe 16 units that you did to maybe 30 unit, 50 unit, so on and so forth? Or did you just kind of stop at the 16 unit and then go for it and start going for 75, 100 unit deals? What did that dynamic look like? I think I was uh, slow. I think I moved slowly. I did, you know, I jumped to 14 out of the duplex, straight out of the duplex. And I stayed in that 14 to 25, 26 for maybe six or seven years. I went through the 2008 collapse. And, you know, that was, that was a great experience. I mean, it was not a fun experience by any means, but, you know, I was able to navigate it. I survived and I saw a lot of investors get taken down by that and, you know, lost their entire portfolio. And uh, it, it affirmed the strategy that I had been dabbling in, but it, it made me more committed to the strategy of B and C class workforce housing, buy affordable, don't buy, you know, top of the market and make sure you do value add, you know, buy it with a plan to add the value. Because during that time, if you just bought a property at retail pricing and, you know, counted on the market, the market was dropping. I think the market dropped maybe 30 to 40% during the, the collapse. And a lot of people got caught. A lot of investors got caught with their properties underwater in mine, you know, knock on wood, fared pretty well. My, I stayed rented. There was always renters during that time. They were a lot of them were moving down from the A and B class properties that were much more expensive because their sale salaries were being cut or they were losing their jobs. But my building stayed full, luckily. Are you starting to position yourself today similar to how you did back then? And I'm not saying we're at the end of a cycle or at the peak of a cycle, but as we record this in early March 2020. Things may or may not be starting to crumble a little bit around us. You know, coronavirus is going around, the stock market's not doing great. <laughs> are you starting to position your real estate to weather a downturn, whether it's now Absolutely. or whether it's coming up? How are you envisioning that? For the last year or two, everything I buy, I look at very carefully as to how is this going to weather a downturn. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I, I, Maybe the coronavirus, who knows what's going to happen with this, but maybe that'll be the thing. But yes, I'm, I'm preparing. I fully expect and am ready to you know, go through a downturn and hopefully I've made the right preparations. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think it's definitely a matter of, of when, not if, although I've kind of been expecting it for a couple of years now. So I am right. definitely not, not the best person to ask in terms of when it's actually going to happen. And I think if anybody knows and they try to tell you they know, then that you should probably run the other way, but it's coming, right? So what exactly are you doing to position yourself for that? I know you said you are. So what specifically are you doing? I think specifically, I have to buy, and it goes back to my the, the cost per square foot, it goes back to the cap rate, it goes back to the strategy and the class of asset. So I don't want to be, I don't want to buy anything that's topped out. So I want to buy a, at a cost per square foot that is less than everything around it, because when the recession occurs, the cost per square foot is going to drop. And if you're paying if the cost per square foot in your market is an average of 350, within a couple months, it could be down to 290. And so you want to be able to absorb that kind of drop. And one of the things that happened to a lot of people during the, the 2008 collapse, and I think I had maybe five or six properties when that happened. One of the things that happened is that even if your property is running fairly well and you're weathering the downturn, the banks that lent you, you know, to have your loan, they have a certain LTV loan to value that they they want you to maintain and your contract stipulates that you have to maintain that. And 
if the prices go down nationally or regionally, they'll mark down the value of your building. And if your loan, you know, you you could be running your property just fine and you could your rent could cover your mortgage, but your bank can call you and say, you know, according to our our valuation, our new recession valuation of your property, you're under, you know, 75% LTV or you're over 75% L, you're over 75% LTV and we want you to make up the difference. And, you know, I think I, I had one property that they, the bank asked me to do that and they, they wanted like 80 grand to make up the difference to get my property to that level. And luckily, you know, I was employed, you know, family guy was, was, you know, doing well through the recession and I was, I, I had a good paying job. So I just paid it, but you know, other, other investors could have been in a different situ- situation. And given that I had six buildings at the time, if all six of them had a lender that wanted me to give them 80 or $90,000, you know, it would have been a problem. That's a really interesting thing to talk about specifically right now, because I hear a lot of investors talk about how, as long as a property is cash flowing, it's a good investment to make even at this yeah, point I in don't the cycle. That. Yeah, it's really I interesting. That. Like, that doesn't matter. Like if it's cash flowing today, like what, for example, what happened in the, when the downturn hit in, in 2008, it was triggered by the collapse of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. Yeah, it, was, it started with Lee, Lehman Brothers and, and Bear Stearns followed. But you know, when that shock hit, for example, I'm in California and California, I don't know the statistics, but construction is, you know, there's about 30% of the population, employed population is in the construction industry in some or some affiliated industry and all construction immediately stop. You know, when the shock of a recession hits or an event like the Lehman Brothers crash, that all immediately stopped. Flippers stop. And so there was a mass of people that instantly became unemployed or underemployed and they couldn't afford the rent. So rents were going down. You know, if you say, I'm going to buy this building because it's cash flowing today. And so that's all I need to worry about. Well, your rents are going to go down most likely in a recession, depending on how bad it is. But any recession, I think you're going to see rent softening. So I think that's not, that's not as safe a strategy as, as some people might think. That's really, really interesting to hear you talk about because I haven't heard a lot of investors talk about that. Usually it's assumed that if you have strong cash flow, then you can weather a downturn. But I'm going to bring up a stock market term. I know this is a real estate show, but my other show is a lot about stock investing and we talk about that a lot and that's margin calls. And so it almost sounds like in the real estate world, there is a potential for a margin call. So it's something you need to take into consideration if you're investing in today's market. Now, to go from just the few units you did at the beginning of your career to over 400 or 500 units, were mentors super important for you? Nowadays, and with podcasts and you know meetups and i think real estate is such a much more social thing and everybody's partnering and and networking i'm embarrassed to say i did yes i did have i did have people that liked me thankfully they liked me and looked out for me but a lot of it was just i was reading books i was you know i was on an island i had to go into a writers room you know i was in the entertainment business i wasn't even in the, the real estate business I was spending 80 hours a week in a writer's room surrounded by, you know, comedy writers. And so I don't know, I didn't know a lot of people, but I knew this was what I was going to do and I would just I was getting emailed, you know, a lot of listings and I just, you know, would analyze almost all of them to some degree and just pick. I would say this this looks good and I would buy it. And I did that over and over and over again. And uh, you know, luckily I was always getting, you know, family guy who we got Canceled twice in those early couple of years, and I never thought it would last. I thought you know I was going to be out of work, looking for a new job, maybe every couple of years. But Family Guy has been a, a bit of a juggernaut, and so I've, I've had the benefit of having good income. And you know, my inclination was just pump that into real estate. And you know, I created a couple of shows along the way, and uh, you know, did that as well. So you know, a lot of my a lot of my social world, my network is all in the entertainment business. But yeah, there's some great people I've met here in Los Angeles and in, in Austin. And uh, yeah, I, I have never really, I can't say exactly that I've had a mentor. I think a lot of it's been figuring it out of myself. I think that's awesome to hear too, though, right? I, mean, I think so many people talk about 
finding a mentor these days. And of course, that's great if you can. It's a super valuable resource. But it's also good to hear situations like yours where you are able to become super successful in the real estate space and in other spaces as well, but specifically real estate here without a mentor. So I want people to hear that that are listening to the show because I don't want them to use it as an excuse. I don't want them to say, oh, I can't do a deal or I can't do my first deal or I can't scale because I don't have a mentor. I don't have anybody to bounce questions off. You know, Mark, you're an example that it can be done with a ton of success. And that was even back before you know, a lot of the technology that's available today. And I talk about this concept a lot where you don't have to have a one-on-one mentor. I'd argue that I don't really personally have a one-on-one mentor that I go to with all kinds of questions, but podcasts and YouTube videos and all these different mediums that are available today that you probably didn't have back when you were investing are available to investors today. And that's essentially like being mentored one-on-one. I recently had Lewis Howes on my other show, Millennial Investing, and he said the same thing. He said, I don't really mentor people one-on-one, not because I don't want to, but because everything I would tell them is already in my podcast. So just go listen to the podcast and that's like you're being mentored. When these guys have 300 episodes, there's every single question you could probably think of is in those episodes. So just go back and listen to it. And so I think it's such an interesting dynamic. And I want to make sure that people really understood your story about that you didn't necessarily need a mentor to be successful. And so that helps get rid of their excuses that they might have. Yeah, you can't use that as a crutch. I I don't think I even ever heard a real estate podcast until maybe 2014. And and there was nobody, yeah, never had a, a mentor. I read books. Like real estate is not that complex of a of a strategy of a, an investment strategy. It's actually pretty simple and I think your best training is to do it. And you know, I just I don't know, maybe I was foolish, but I just knew, you know, I I I was ready to take the plunge. I didn't want to sit on the fence when uh, you know that first opportunity came up and sure, I was terrified and anxious and thought, had filled with regret and thought I had made a huge mistake, but you know, within a, within a year, year and a half, I had embraced it entirely and was just reading everything I could, reading books, because even not a ton of real estate information was even online back in the early 2000s. Yeah, you can't use that as, as an excuse. Just uh, educate yourself. If you ever break down what a mentor tells you, step away and think, is that something that's such secret knowledge, forbidden knowledge? It's mostly stuff that's already out there and you're already hearing it. Yeah. I mean, I feel the same way. And I think mentors do have a lot of value. But like you said, if you have a question, I would say 99.999% of the time, you could do a quick Google search and probably have a dozen different answers that will answer your question just as good as a mentor would. So there's really just not that excuse these days. And like you said, and I really like what you said about how real estate investing really isn't super complex, right? I think a lot of times people try and make it overly complex when you really boil it down real estate investing really, it can be hard to do at times, but it's not a complex concept, right? You just need to read a few books, listen to a few podcasts, watch YouTube videos. You'll get your head around the idea of what it is. And then you just really need to go out there, take action and do it. And you know, one of the sort, I always had sources of guidance and I met a lot of brokers and I got to know pretty much every broker in Los Angeles because I wanted them to send me deals. And I also you know, went beyond brokers Brokers always have an agenda. So they were always trying to get you to, to buy the deal. And they didn't necessarily have, have your best interest in mind or completely have your back. I met some great brokers who always gave me honest guidance. Basically, I appreciate a broker if they simply accurately underwrite the deal. Because so many deals that show up in my inbox, I spend 30 seconds looking at the underwriting in the expenses. And I realized this is absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's inaccurate. And if I were to buy it based on these numbers, I would uh, lose my shirt. But I did, you know, accidentally, I, you know, it was not something I deliberately did, but I started to use, I found that I had a, a, a loan broker who I was using more and more often, and then eventually exclusively. And this is a guy who, uh, he steer, steered me in, the outset, all I wanted was the best interest rate, best interest rate, best terms. And he often had the best rates. And so that's why I began this relationship with him. But over time, you know, I was doing all my, my deals with him and I was giving him a lot of business and a lot of refinances. And he was somebody that had been in the business for 40 years. And I think I've gotten some of the most insightful and helpful mentor style guidance from him. 
And because he didn't have a vested interest, he was just giving me the loan, but he would usually weigh in on the deal itself and the location. And he would give me really high level insights and high level, level, you know, subtle strategies that improved the operations and improved the deals. And, and that was, that's something that I, I don't think I ever could have gotten from a, you know, one of those online podcast driven mentors. I think that, you know, you just need to be working closely with someone who knows the market intimately and has been doing it for 30 years or 40 years. Anybody could get, find that person if they develop that relationship. I want to talk about how you're finding deals today in the two markets that we've talked about because LA and Austin are arguably two of the more expensive markets in the US. They're growing, but they're also very expensive. So how are you able to find good deals worth buying in today's market? I think what helped me, you know, I I started in LA. I didn't know anything else. I never when I got started I never even considered investing out of state or investing in a cheaper market, which a lot of people do today, especially if they live in an expensive city like LA. But I I got pushed into it by this broker. In Los Angeles, one of the things that helps is that Los Angeles is huge. I think I read that there's something like 3 million parcels in the county, in, in Los Angeles County, and it's a big renter city. So I'm taking a wild guess here, but out of 3 million parcels, there might be maybe, I would guess, take a wild guess, but maybe there's 800,000 multifamily properties in the county of LA. And at any given time, say there's 5% of the inventory on the market. What is that? Is that 40,000? Is that, is that right? 40,000 properties on the market? I mean, that's a huge, a huge pool of properties to look at. In the county of LA, and you just pick through those, and and you can even you you, first of all you have brokers sending you deals, and you hope that your relationships have narrowed those down to kind of pre-screened properties that they're pretty good properties or very good properties. But I and people badmouth online sites like LoopNet, but in a in a, a market like Los Angeles, I find it helpful. I'll just go on and. I don't want to sift through 20,000 properties. I want to narrow it down to use filters to, to screen my specific criteria in terms of cost per square foot, specific criteria in terms of cap rate, and then pick the range of size. And then it, it narrows it down to a, a very small batch. But because of the size of LA, you know, I might be looking at 50 buildings that all fit the cost per square foot that I have, the cap rate and the size. And then from there, I'm just looking at those neighborhoods. And I've lived in Los Angeles long enough that I, I look like, where is this property? And what, what is the bogeyman about that property? Why is it this affordable? And if there's nothing that jumps out as a, you know, an unfixable problem, I look at it pretty seriously. And I'm mostly driven by I'm always looking for an up and coming market. I don't buy top heavy markets that have already appreciated and are really high priced. I go for cheap markets, cheap areas of LA that are in the core, core locations that are maybe on the fringe of better neighborhoods, but are, are being impacted by the growth of that hotter market. Why have you decided to stay in LA and Austin for your main markets? I mean, You're nearing 500 units. You have good systems in place. I'm assuming you have probably a good team behind you. You understand real estate. You know how to analyze markets. So why haven't you taken everything you've built so far in those two cities and scaled to a different city that might have more opportunities? I think LA always has opportunities. I think I've never, I've never not found a building. I think I've mentioned this before or kind of was thinking about it, but at any given time, if anybody told me, oh, you can't find a property worth buying in LA, give me 20 minutes and I'll find a building that I would buy. And you just put those filters in, search everything on the market. And suddenly, you know, there's anomalies. That's one of the beautiful things about real estate is it's nowhere nearly as efficiently priced as say the stock market. I mean, everything is personally priced by the owner. And so there's anomalies, there's market dislocations all over the place. And some, you know, every, some sellers are 
more motivated than others. So yeah, you could, I think I could always quickly find a deal worth buying in LA. You know, I say that cautiously. In Austin, it's a little tougher. Austin is smaller. And I think the properties tend to be bigger unit numbers. They're usually those, uh, those bigger garden style. There's a lot of hundred plus apartment complexes in Austin. So yeah, there's, there's a big difference between how much inventory there is available in Los Angeles and how much inventory there is in Austin. But uh, I like those two markets. I think I'll stay in those markets. I'm open to going elsewhere too. I don't want to spread myself all over the country. It's contrarian to what you hear on a lot of podcasts is people always say, go for cash flow. And you know I don't want to badmouth any markets that I don't know about, but I'm always very cautious about Going into rural, tertiary, you know, third tier markets. For example, if you're investing in the stock market, you know, you want to buy Google or Amazon or Apple or you want to buy those powerhouse companies. And I think similarly in real estate, you want to buy into a powerhouse economy. And LA is a powerhouse economy. It's got a huge, it's the center of the world for enter- entertainment. It's a big tech hub, it's a financial hub, medical. It's got multiple you know, major colleges. Austin is similar. It's got a diverse economy. I think I'm a, a, an investor who wants to buy in prime markets. I want those powerhouse economies. Those are going to weather the downturn. As soon as the, the economy turns soft, those people who are in the sticks, investing in the sticks, seeing great cash flow. I mean, it's the equivalent of buying a, a beaten down, a company that's going out of business. I'm sure the, the Sears stock paid a huge dividend towards the end because I don't know enough about the stock market to weigh in on that stuff. But um, I think people investing in real estate should remember that there's a the rule of buying quality assets, quality locations is really important. And don't chase cash flow out of a good area. Cash flow is going to be lower in a in a prime market because of the competition in uh, you know, for example, in Los Angeles, you've got that's one of the prime real estate markets in the world. You've got Chinese buyers. China has exploded in in population and and in wealth. It's become a a newly wealthy country. And so is India. And you know, luckily for all of us in the United States, the United States remains one of the most desirable. It's the most stable political system, you know, despite what our, our current climate is, we still have the most stable economy most stable political system and most stable currency. And I think most of the rest of the world wants to put their money in United States assets. And real estate is one of those assets of choice because everybody understands real estate. So they stick to basically in the United States, more or less three or four markets. It's uh, it's on the West Coast, it's LA, San Francisco, Seattle. On the East Coast, it's New York, probably Boston, Miami. But I read somewhere that you know, there's about $500 billion of foreign money invested in US real estate each year. And I think 90% of that goes to uh, Miami, Florida, New York City, and Los Angeles. So let's take it back for new investors. For someone just getting started, maybe done a couple of deals, what would be the number one piece of advice that you would give them from all that you've learned from when you first got started to where you are today? The number one thing I would say, and this is a, uh, in the context of where we are in the market cycle, you know, the market is cyclical. Do not be fooled into thinking the way it is now is the way it's going to be two years from now. The real estate market and the economy itself is cyclical. It goes from expansion, growth to oversupply, and then recession. And that's sort of a natural cycle. It's like the seasons. And you could see it's kind of a, a, a cool and amazing process. And it's all natural. Like when rents are going up and the economy is booming, builders build and, and financing is very available. And that's where we are now. And what happens is builders don't build to need, they build according to what funds are available. And right now, funds are easily available. So what you're going to see is, is, they build and it becomes kind of this irrational exuberance situation where you know they build beyond what the need is and then there's oversupply and then prices go down naturally they're going to go down and that's that's the the recession process 
So I would say uh, to investors, you know, be conservative and be disciplined and be persistent. You know, don't give up. Don't be emotional. This is a, a logical, strategic game. Play it like that and just keep at it. I think that's really good advice. Mark, for those listening to the show today that want to go connect with you further, learn more about what you got going on, where can they go to find you? You could visit my website. About five years ago, I started a company to formalize my investing. It was called Quantum Capital Inc. You could go to quantumcapitalinc.com and you could reach out to me through the website. And uh, yeah, reach out anybody. Uh, I'd love to help. I'd like to help new investors. And yeah, that's it. Awesome. I'll be sure to put a link to those resources in the show notes so everyone listening today can go check it out. As always, I'll also put links to books related to the different topics that we talked about throughout the show. So you can go dive into those more, read more about it, learn more about the different things that you're interested in. Mark, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. This was great. I really appreciate you having me on. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Real Estate Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.